A 25 year old lady presented with fever of one month duration with ataxia and headache and the brain imaging is showing the dilated ventricles with the basal exudates. What is the CSF finding? As uh, we have emphasized, the most common topic in neurology is meningitis. Any entrance, any day, need 2013 or need 2014, any year, invariably one question will be there on the topic of the meningitis. So, this combination of one month fever is a little long duration and the headache with the dilated ventricles and the basal exudates is all suggestive of tuberculous meningitis is what you need to basically remember. Now, tell me doctor, what are the important CSF findings in bacterial meningitis? If you happen to look at the CSF to serum glucose ratio, it will be hypoglycorrhea. That is low glucose levels will be there less than 0.4. Increased protein concentration will be there and gram staining will be typically positive as what you have read. And there can be development of a purulent exudate as what you are able to see over here. And if you happen to stain the CSF, as a house surgeon you carry the CSF to the lab and at least one, at least one time you need to, if you look through the microscope forever you will have that conviction towards the topic of meningitis. Doing a lumbar puncture is the part and parcel of uh, the housemanship uh, clinical privileges, which you need to definitely take a privilege of uh, doing a at least 5 to 6 LPs at housemanship level, never the chance comes in life. Now this is a typical subarachinoid space which is being filled with the neutrophils is what you are able to see. And uh, once meningitis is for a long period of time, it will interfere with the drainage of the CSF and that typically lead to the development of hydrocaphilus as one of the complications of uh, a old meningitis is what you are able to see here with the ventricular enlargement. And uh, some of the meningitis, especially tuberculous meningitis, it is known to lead to development of vasculitis as a complication. Because of that there will be a hypoxic ischemic injury to the brain. So, this is a typical vas vessel which had been infiltrated with uh, a lot of uh, polymorphonuclear uh, leukocytes uh, uh, with the vasculitis as one of the complications. That is the reason because of that ischemic injury, patients will develop focal neurological deficits. That is what we need to fundamentally appreciate. Temporal lobe abscess can be one of the important uh, complications of uh, a prolonged bacterial meningitis. Now, what are the findings in CSF in viral meningitis, doctor? There is a lymphocytic predominance with a normal glucose and uh, normal to slightly elevated protein concentration is what you have in typical viral meningitis. Normal glucose will be there. Then TB meningitis is lymphocytic predominant, there is a low glucose concentration with a, of course just like bacterial meningitis, a high protein, but uh, a cobweb appearance is what you need to remember. Now what are the important features of the third cranial nerve palsy? So, you must be very sure of all the cranial nerves, how do the lesions present, what muscles do they supply, everything you need to have in tips, uh, you must be 100 percent sure doctor. So, you know very well that there is one muscle, the levator palpebrae superioris is innervated by the oculomotor, that is the reason if it is not there, then there will be ptosis. Then typically how will be the pupil, pupil parasympathetic innervation which lead to meiosis is from oculomotor. So, if it is not working then pupil become dilated and how will be the eye, the eye will be down and out, typically down and out because of the unopposed action of the lateral rectus which will make it out, superior oblique which will make it down, typically in case of third cranial nerve. Palsy. Now, what are the drugs which are used in multiple sclerosis? 
Multiple sclerosis is fundamentally a demyelinating disorder. You all know very well. There is a demyelination, gliosis, neuronal loss and typically it has got a relapsing, remitting and a progressive clinical course. That is what we have to basically remember. How does a patient with multiple sclerosis present? He may present with uh, a typical involvement of uh, a guide disturbance, visual blurring can be there. Then there is a feature called Lermit sign, electrical shock like sensation which is passing along the spine. Any of them can be the presenting features. But uh, why it is called multiple sclerosis? Because the clinical features and the evolution of the disease is typically disseminated in the time and space is what you have to fundamentally understand. And we basically use the glucocorticoids because for anything in medicine there is only one final drug that is steroids. So they are used to manage the um, first attack or acute exacerbations. So what are the different ways by which the clinical presentation can be? It can be relapsing, remitting like this or it can be relapsing, remitting with a secondary progression or it can be primarily progressive in nature and it can be progressive relapsing different ways by which it can clinically present. So whenever multiple stenosis is relapsing, patient presents acutely, after that you have given steroids and it has resolved and once more there is a flare up. So whenever there is a relapsing form of multiple sclerosis, then what are the various drugs that we use? Interferon beta 1a, interferon beta 1b, glatiramer acetate, natalizumab, mitoxantron and uh, fingolamid. These are the important uh, group of drugs. How does glatiramer acetate act in multiple sclerosis? Fundamentally what is the problem, why there is a demyelination? Because it is an autoimmune injury, the helper T cells in the body mistook the myelin of the nerves and started attacking it. We will try to bring down their enthusiasm and tell them that this is Ramus nerve only, not Somus nerve to the Ramus T cells and make the Ramus T cells to not attack the Ramus nerves, that is what we have to do. How does glatiramer will do that? Glatiramer is like a granima. It will come and uh, typically will do what is called as a bystander suppression effect. It will convert the uh, reactive T cells. It will basically uh, make the secretion of uh, down regulating interleukins called interleukin 4 which in turn will lead to the suppression of that attacking T cells. So that is the main mechanism of glatiramer is to promote the IL-4 production which is having a suppressive effect on this attacking T cells is what we have to fundamentally appreciate. Natilizumab is a good drug but with the usage of the Natilizumab there is one of the important problem of Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is one of the important complications that we need to fundamentally remember. Now what is the drug which is used in multiple sclerosis out of all this? It is the interferon beta which is most commonly used. So you know how important it is the topic of management of multiple sclerosis. Of course this session's main purpose is to bring to your notice what areas you need to focus ultimately? You need to once more sit silently in that same reading room or library and uh, while reading multiple sclerosis at least you should remember hey, that day it is such an important question, let me focus on that. So that is the whole purpose of the coaching doctor. Now what is the drug which is very important for improving uh, the uh, expanded disability status score? What is the usage of expanded disability status score? Fundamentally what it uh, says is, if you have treated the patient, how much his diplopia improved, how much the mobility improved, 
how the symptomatic improvement is there and quality of the life of the patient has improved. We use various drugs, but out of all these drugs, which is the one which will measure, which will bring a real difference in the expanded disability status score is the question of the examiner. So, it is the interferon beta which will reduce the attack rate, improve the disease severity measurements and uh, typically it will decrease the MRI documented disease burden. What do you mean by MRI documented disease burden? How do you calculate the disease burden of multiple sclerosis on MRI? Multiple sclerosis lead to demyelinating blocks based on the number of blocks, how much they are uh, severe. All these features we calculate what is called a disability score, the disease load on MRI. Even that also is decreased by the interferon beta. Similarly, glatiramer acetate is another important drug which is also known to benefit the disease severity scoring is what we need to understand. How does natilizumab fundamentally what is the mechanism of action? Natilizumab it will disrupt the vascular adhesion of the T lymphocytes by inhibiting what is called as a very late antigen VLA4 and uh, it will fundamentally uh, decrease the traffic of the lymphocyte reaching the nerves and damaging them. It acts like a traffic police fundamentally. It will stop the traffic because CM is going kind of a job is basically done by natilizumab. But unfortunately though if you use natilizumab there is a risk of what is one important complication? Multifocal leukoencephalopathy can result out of it. Natilizumab out of all is the one which offers highest improvement in the EDSS scoring of uh, the multiple sclerosis is what we need to remember. Now a 75 year old presents with a new onset of the focal seizures and he has got a normal renal function. What is the drug that you want to basically prefer? So doctor, we need to remember how do you identify focal seizures? So this kind of a lip smacking, Jacksonian march. So these are the features of a focal seizure. So the, for this kind of seizures, we can use carbamazepine you can see clearly the presence of focal seizures here. Carbamazepine, oxy, carbazine and uh, lamotrigine, topiramate and the phenytoin and valproate is an alternative drug but any day carbamazepine is the one which you prefer in case of the focal or partial seizures is what you have to fundamentally appreciate. You can also use the levetiracetam, genisamide, gabapentin also in the management of uh, the partial seizures. Then what is the best way to treat this kind of primarily generalized tonic clonic seizures basically. We use valproate and lamotrigine are the best initial choice for the primarily generalized tonic clonic seizures. So here you need to differentiate doctor. You have partial seizures generalized seizures. In the generalized seizures you have primarily generalized and those which are partial seizures initially which later on became secondarily generalized. How do you identify whether it is primarily generalized or secondarily generalized? Are there any aura you look for? Presence of an aura means it is secondarily generalized because aura is like a focal seizure. It is like a focal seizure because the electrical activity in the temporal lobe. Then presence of postictal phenomena, torch palsy etc. after the seizure is over, there also the features would suggest it is secondarily generalized not primarily generalized is what you have to fundamentally understand. Valproate is one of the very broad spectrum anti-epileptic doctor. It is used in the absent seizure, myoclonic and atonic seizures. In all the three varieties it can be used. And whenever you have a general epilepsy syndrome where you have mixed seizures, which anti-epileptic shall I use if that thought comes to the mind? 
then what is the best drug? Valproate is what you have to basically remember. Now, let us look at the AIMS November 2011 question once more on multiple sclerosis. So, you open textbook means general medicine may which chapter you will start first neurology highest number of questions are asked always from neurology out of 30 at least 7 to 8 questions will come in neurology sometimes even 10 questions in neurology second most important is cardiology after that rheumatology endocrinology nephrology hematology by the time you become anemic if you still have time you can look at lung uh, then other things the most important decision you need to do is with a little time where to focus that is what you need to depend on most of the times if you look at the last few years tendency any entrance examiner general medicine means neurology then comes the cardiology so be very sure within neurology also now you know which areas to focus multiple sclerosis within multiple sclerosis what to focus treatment various drugs few things about how we diagnose that's all mbbs level may huh? so what is the feature which prognosticate the multiple sclerosis in a better light that is a good prognostic factors are what? Bad prognostic factors are what? Certain features are more favorable. What you are seeing here in this individual is basically a visual impairment in the right eye. In the right eye. And uh, in this uh, visually impaired eye, when the light is thrown, normally meiosis occurs, it is not occurring. It is called as afferent pupillary defect, which is typically seen whenever there is an optic neuritis. So, just I wanted to show you uh, that this patient had a optic neuritis. So, optic neuritis, if it is the presenting feature of the multiple stenosis, is it good or bad? It is good. It carries a favorable prognosis. If there are paresthesias like sensory symptoms at onset, it is good prognostic feature. And if there are less than two relapses in the first year of illness with minimal impairment after five years, then you basically call it as a good prognosis kind of a multiple sclerosis is what need to be remembered. Whereas, what are bad features? What you are able to see here is, it is called as titubation, truncal ataxia. If somebody had a cerebellar dysfunction, then he will have this kind of a titubation basically. And in uh, demyelination of multiple sclerosis, it can involve the cerebellum. So, this kind of a titubation with truncal ataxia, if it is there, bad prognosis. Similarly, pyramidal symptoms. What do you mean by pyramidal tract? Corticospinal pathway, Babinski sign positivity, hemiplegia, all these pyramidal features. They are also bad feature or a progressive disease course. We have seen no relapsing, remitting, remitting, progressive, progressive, remitting. Uh, I never understood the terminology of the multiple sclerosis uh, clinical uh, subtypes. Eh? But anyway, progressive course also bad prognosis. Then CSF wise, if you have any mononuclear cell pleocytosis or increased level of immunoglobulin G levels in the CSF, that also um, I mean, there are the important abnormalities found uh, and uh, uh, we measure what is called as oligoclonal banding in the CSF. Increased production of this immunoglobulin G oligoclonal bands is uh, another important feature of uh, the multiple sclerosis. Now comes the modern epidemic of the world pandemic of the world. What is that? Alzheimer's. Everything about Alzheimer's you should remember until you forget. So, that is the rule. Dementia is one uh, DM neurology level case presentation doctor. MD level ka bhi nahi hai. 
But uh, to examine a dementia patient and decide uh, what is the cause of dementia, yeah, if it is a reversible cause of dementia, good. Suppose if somebody had a vitamin B12 deficiency with dementia, if you have treated him with uh, vitamin B12, he will remember everything. Where did he meet his wife for the, at the first time? How did he propose? How he got married? How many times he fought? For what reasons he fought? Everything he will uh, remember. A man who totally forgotten everything. Suppose somebody had hypothyroidism with severe dementia, reversible. But there are certain irreversible causes of dementia, like vascular dementia. Somebody had a stroke with ischemia, which is involving the memory areas, then it is irreversible. You can't do anything. So all our job in clinical examination is to identify whether it's a reversible or an irreversible cause of dementia. Now let us talk about Alzheimer's. You need to know a few terms in uh, meanings of few terms in neurology doctor. What is meant by apraxia? The person is clear minded. He knows what is his name, everything. He has no weakness, he has no ataxia or any extra pyramidal derangement and no problem with his motor power or sensory system. But he loses the ability to execute a highly complex and a previously learned skill. The wife of the patient will come and tell you, doctor my husband is unable to wear the shirt. Then he will say maybe there is a fracture, there may be a pain. There can be many reasons why one can't be able to wear a shirt. But motor power is alright, sensory system is alright, person's consciousness is clear, he is not comatose, but he lost his earlier skill because of the loss of the motor planning in the brain, which is basically called apraxia. Echalicalia, simple arithmetic, to perform the calculations one lost the ability. Aphasia is the loss of the production of a comprehensible speech and written language because of an acquired lesion in the brain. Then what is meant by agnosia, anjan marna, that is uh, failing to recognize familiar objects, familiar faces called visual agnosia. So, in spite of good perception, good memory, good language, good general intellectual ability, if he fails to recognize the familiar objects, you basically call it as agnosia. So out of all this, which is a early feature, early clinical presenting feature in Alzheimer type of dementia is an important question. It is the impairment of the recent memory and as the disease progresses, the person becomes disoriented to time and finally he will be disoriented to place. So that is what. So you will be doing all the clinical tests to know how is his recent memory if you are suspecting Alzheimer's dementia. Always if the disease is milder, difficult to diagnose. If it is severe, still you did not diagnose means your knowledge is mild. So you must be very sure uh, uh, neurology is mathematics. Aphasia, anomia, echalicalia. Any of them can develop in case of Alzheimer's. Surely, visuospatial disorientation with agnosia can develop and uh, apraxia develops only later in the course of the clinical illness. Early is the loss of the recent memory. Now, once more, Ames November 2011 question. A four month pregnant lady who is on treatment with valproate tells you, Doctor, I came to know Valproate is teratogenic, shall I stop it now? Already she is four months pregnant. After burning hand, supplying burnall. So what do you want to advise her? If you ask her to stop, seizures will be a complication. If you ask her to continue, there is no problem because already the damaging teratogenic period of three, first three months is over. So that is the reason doctor, while taking uh, a radiograph in a reproductive aged female, you should always ask for the menstrual history. Similarly, while giving any teratogenic drug, you should always uh, religiously take the menstrual history. That is very, very important. Uh, 
and all these things comes with practice and to not do to not ask those questions also comes with practice be very sure both of them will come with anyway practice so that's the reason let us practice good things so doctor the children who are born to the mothers who are receiving epileptic treatment they'll have around 5 to 6% teratogenic problems unlike the general population who will have 2 to 3% teratogenic effects in the healthy women so there is a basic difference now uh, already since the patient took it for about 4 months there is no need of uh, there is no benefit of changing the valprate now in which condition neurons are exclusively affected out of all these conditions supranuclear palsy cortico basal degeneration otherwise called cbd cortico basal degeneration multi system atrophy it is nothing but a variant of parkinsonism parkinsonism along with autonomic fun, uh, dysfunction together you call it as scheidragger's syndrome which is associated with multi system atrophy and spinal cerebellar ataxia first these are all greek and latin for you even after entering md first 6 months neurology is greek and latin for all of us after that we came to know that are pura discussion karne ke baad ye log vitamin e de rahe diagnose debate ha uh, debate diagnose discharge with vitamins that is neurology pura discuss karte do teen ghante baith ke one will be betting on the other over the diagnosis and finally will be writing multivitamin tablet and telling the patient already myopathy is in severe phase you go home and uh, respiratory involvement aane ke baad aa jao we will do intubation and put you on ventilator unfortunately neurological problems are uh, static or progressive you always uh, need to classify the disorder into static it won't progress or will it progress accordingly the patient's life is going to be decided now let us talk about each of these conditions doctor spino cerebellar ataxia what are they they are inherited disorders there are problems in basal ganglia brain stem spinal cord optic nerve retina peripheral nerves depending upon how many of them got involved and what is the type of inheritance we have subdivided them into spino cerebellar ataxia type 1 type 2 must there is a lot of things now what is meant by progressive supranuclear palsy this you need to know very clearly there is a degeneration in the basal ganglia basal ganglia degeneration means immediately what condition comes to your mind at mbbs level parkinsonism doctor it will also be like parkinsonism these are all called parkinson plus syndromes in addition there is also involvement of limbic structures limbic system is important for memory so if it got involved means people will have dementia and certain selected areas of the cerebral cortex and brain stem all of them are basically involved in progressive supranuclear palsy how do they present they will have a restricted eye movement typically so that is the reason you will ask the patient to look up look down look left look right and then see how is the ocular movement so if there is any restriction of the movement of the eye in the vertical gauge then you think of possibility of supranuclear palsy especially they have an impairment of downward gaze if you don't look what will happen we fall so typically patients uh, attendant will say doctor my father is all right he is a wonderful uh, retired inspector general of police he never uh, looked down always looked up only and uh, doctor recently he is having forgetfulness and uh, he is having little rigidity in walking and also he is having history of falls that's how you basically come to uh, get an idea you see this individual he is having a typical shuffling gait just like parkinsonism and he lost the dexterity of movement he is not able to uh, move the fingers that easily 
and he has got a difficulty in gait basically and when you stand behind the patient and then pull they won't be able to withstand and they will fall down retro propulsion test so if you happen to make the person to stand back and pull you must be ready to catch him so that's how you basically identify so early guide disturbances but when will be a real problem if guide disturbance is there somebody will help to move they don't bring to doctor typically a patient came to the doctor means uh, uh, brought by the attendant means generally attendants are all busy software engineer son bank officer daughter in law where will they get time to bring the old man to the clinic they brought means some bigger problem is there not just guide disturbance he had a difficulty in speech and swallowing also and he is having forgetfulness so that is the later stage of the progressive supranuclear palsy is what you have to remember and uh, typically the downward gaze is impaired and it presents just like parkinsonism so these are the important points you need to remember then cortico basal degeneration what is this condition basically it is a slowly progressive illness where once more basal ganglia and cerebral cortex there is a development of gliosis what is gliosis it is like a fibrosis in the brain is gliosis now how do they typically present they will have asymmetric dystonic contractions and clumsiness of one hand is typical feature and this kind of a phenomena called alien limb phenomena they will be thinking that some uh, unknown hand is basically acting in the space it is not the hand which they are seeing what this lady is uh, trying to do is she is slapping herself by an unknown hand alien hand syndrome is uh, typically a alien hand syndrome some unknown hand has come and beating her so apraxia agnosia focal myoclonus and alien limb phenomena and asymmetric dystonic contractions these are all the features which you see in cortico basal degeneration is what you need to remember so whenever you have a patient of dementia he can be alzheimers he can be cbd cortico basal degeneration he can be supranuclear palsy patient or he can be a multi system atrophy patient where parkinsonism along with uh, the autonomic dysfunction and dementia all of them can supervene now uh, what is one important feature about parkinsonism typically the tremor which you see in parkinsonism always is asymmetrical tremor if at all it is symmetrical it is not parkinsonism that is the most important rule which need to be remembered tremor is typically asymmetrical but these people who have cortico basal degeneration they can present with symmetrical tremor of the parkinsonism what is the tremor of parkinsonism rest tremor is the tremor of the parkinsonism intention tremor is tremor of cerebellar dysfunction and flapping tremor is typically seen in hepatic encephalopathy etc etc so you must be very sure then you have one more important entity called multi system atrophy where substantia nigra cerebellum and inferior olivary nucleus any of them in fact all of them they undergo degeneration in case of multi system atrophy so how do they present they can present uh, with predominantly cerebellar clinical features or they may present with uh, basal ganglia features like the parkinsonism there are two forms in which whatever it is they are associated with autonomic dysfunction additionally that's how you basically recognize now because of this degeneration of the cerebellum and the uh, and uh, and uh, the olivary nucleus uh, how does the brain stem typically look like typically the pons is atrophied because of the see see doctor i think now you might have already got an idea this is the cerebellum this is the cerebral cortex this is the spinal cord 
and this part is basically the brain stem and brain stem the lowest part is medulla above that you are having pons and above that you are having mid brain okay i think you had enough uh, uh, technical uh, run through in the morning session eh? so doctor because of this it looks like a uh, the, the area looks like a uh, typical um, cross bun sign it is called it looks like a cross bun multi system atrophy may if you look at the mri now uh, uh, when you suspect multi system atrophy basically you will first diagnose that the patient is having parkinsonism but may since there is autonomic dysfunction you will suspect it is not purely parkinsonism it is parkinson plus also there are cerebellar signs there is a orthostatic hypotension all these features along with parkinsonism will make you to think of multi system atrophy is what you have to fundamentally understand whether it is cortico basal degeneration or multi system atrophy or progressive supranuclear palsy in all this it is the glial cells which are the ones which are affected in the brain but only in spino cerebellar ataxia it is the neurons the axons of the neurons are the ones which are basically affected is the point of interest so this pictorial will give you a quick summary the neat 2013 exam is going to be pictorial at least some 30 questions will be diagrams pictures identify like a lkg ukg children uh, coloring book so if it is algemes where is the problem doctor cerebral cortex and in hippocampus huntington's disease there is a dementia and uh, it is a striatum which is affected and you have uh, parkinsonism substantia nigra is affected and charcot marie tooth syndrome it is the peripheral nerves which are uh, affected and you have um, uh, the location where the what is affected in which location is what you have to be very clear now the aims november 2011 also a repeat of november 2006 question is which is not a limb girdle dystrophy honestly limb girdle dystrophy like topics are not at mbbs level mbbs level may to know parkinsonism is uh, too much and to know that that parkinsonism is different from wolf parkinson's white disease ka parkinsonism is most important you will get a gold medal so now the question comes what are the different limb girdle dystrophies mainly a proximal weakness that is one important feature and it will be sparing the distal muscles the myopathy in limb girdle dystrophy may and the facial muscles and extraocular muscles are not involved unlike in myasthenia gravis even that also lead to myopathy but there the extraocular muscles are involved here it is not involved that's how you basically identify in turn there is a classification of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies as kevolinopathies uh, dysferlinopathies dystrophoglycopathies laminopathy sarcoglycopathy uh, tirupati finally uh, in the sense uh, you need to uh, remember too many pathies you will forget the original pathi so be very sure don't uh, go into a olympic racing in memorizing the things don't do that we will be insulting our simple mind and prevent it to perform well in exam if we try to mug up too many unnecessary things but anyway i leave to you the literature most of this limb girdle muscular dystrophies they are all in autosomal recessive fashion with few subtypes which are autosomal dominant um, uh, now i don't think there will be no place for this kind of questions in need 2013 or 14 or 15 because uh, uh, at least the medical council promises to give some uh, reasonable meaningful clinically oriented what a simple mortals called house surgeons can answer